Why should Māori vote for Labor and not the party Māori or the Greens? We've got to make sure we keep national out. Um, and Labor has a track record of speaking up and advancing issues concerning Māori. I'm incredibly proud of our Māori team, um, who have been staunch advocates for Māori. They've pushed for progress, and we've been making it. I just want to pick up on... Um some of the, the racist rhetoric that's been thrown around in this campaign. Like for Māori, every election feels very... It, it just feels like we're just going to get targeted all the time. And I wonder if this... If, if you're picked up on that. It's clearly been part of this campaign. And I've been involved in election campaigns before where it's also been a feature. 2005 certainly springs mm. to mind. I used to get incensed driving down the hut road and seeing those iwi kiwi billboards. They just used to make me absolutely wild. I mean, what's the difference between the two? You know, it, it was just an outrage. Mm. But the um, <clears throat> I, made a, I made a decision in this election campaign that I would speak openly about these issues because I do think in New Zealand political history there have been two approaches. There's the parties who deliberately stoke division around issues around Māori, and then there's a party that's, that sort of stays silent on it, not wanting to offend the people who might be sympathetic to that. Yeah. I, I've, I've chosen the third option, which is actually to speak openly about them. Um, I don't think that um, non-Māori New Zealanders have anything to fear by Māori having a greater degree of self-determination, or Māori having better health outcomes, or Māori having better educational outcomes, um, or co-governance type arrangements. We have everything to gain from them. Mm. So, I, you know, with this law and order, it always gets chucked out at, at elections as well. And the suggestion has been a vote for Labour and the Greens is a vote for the mongrel mob as well and gangs. So how do you respond to that? Look, I don't think gangs play a useful role in society at all. You know, they peddle misery, and particularly the role of gangs and drugs, you know, and, and drug supply within the community, um, I think is something that we should be concerned about. But... Let's take a step back and ask, how, how do young people end up in gangs in the first place? If they felt accepted in the community, if they felt they had a meaningful place in the community without being in a gang, would they end up in a gang in the first place? You know, somewhere along the way, there's a deeper failing here that we're missing. And I think that better educational outcomes, better health outcomes, better employment outcomes for Māori, again, actually is going to tackle a lot of these very issues. Um, a lot of the young people that end up in gangs are, are, have basically been excluded from the rest of society. This is the outcome that we're getting from decades and decades of quite divisive approaches. Mm. So um, we did a special on gangs with Gang Fano, who spoke from their lived experience, and we learnt that not all gang members are criminals and not all mm. criminals are gang members. There's, there's reasons for that, right? OK. Isn't the fact that gangs are voting, isn't that a good thing? I think everybody voting is a good thing. Um, I'm certainly well, these not, are people that have been um, traditionally disconnected. I'm certainly not asking for the support uh, from, from gangs. And like I said, I, I, you know, in issues around drug dealing, I, I, th I think that they're just involved in misery, and I don't like the violence that's associated with gangs. And I, we have seen an escalation in gang tension and gang violence um, in the last couple of years that isn't acceptable. And so I'd completely back the police and their work to, to deal with that. But I want to, again, take a step back and say, how, do the, how are these kids ending up in gangs in the first place? What is it, what's going wrong that they're ending up there in the first place? Well, what's the difference between um, Labor and Nationals' policy around gangs? I think we want to get... Under, I think Labor wants to actually look at the underlying dysfunction that's behind a lot of gang-related offending and say, how can we actually turn that around? Thinking about these young kids... Kids doing ram raids, as Minister of Police, I got the police and other agencies to give me a breakdown of who these kids were. Of the 96 repeat ram raiders, that's how many there were. So when I ask, how many kids have done more than five ram raids? That's, that that mm. to me makes them a prolific ram raider. Mm. There were 96 of them. Mm. More than 90% of those kids are in a household with someone who's been in prison or is otherwise involved in the corrections system. This is a cycle that is repeating itself. So... What can we do about that? Well, actually, you know, simply tr giving those kids a harsher punishment isn't going to change their, rea their lived reality at all. How about Labor's proposed youth detention centres? I mean, what have, what have we learnt from uh, the investigation into abuse and state care? What we've learned is that we've got to spend a lot more time looking at those Oranga Tamariki youth justice facilities to make sure they're safe places for those serious young offenders to be. I want far fewer young offenders ending up in them in the first place, though. The fast track 
program that we've put in place where we, where if kids are being picked up for things like RAM rating, we're getting them into an intensive support program. 75% of those kids haven't gone on to reoffend because we're actually working with the whānau, we're working with the family to say, okay, what's going wrong in these kids' lives? Because it's often not just the kids, it's also the, the parents and the adults. There's all these statistics that are tossed around that crime is escalating, that um, gang membership is escalating, youth crimes are escalating. So this creates a moral panic. So what is the actual reality? It's a mixed bag. So some areas of criminal offending have certainly been trending down. So if you look at burglary, for example, we're seeing you know, home, home burglaries, we're seeing a decline there relatively consistently over um, quite a period of time. Um, the recent spikes that we've seen have been in a couple of areas. Um, youth offending, particularly around retail offending, so things like smash and grabs, ram raids and so on. The other area is around violent offending. When you look beneath those statistics, though, it tells you a little bit more which is useful to know. We introduced a new offence, for example, around strangulation. That's actually been a big contributor to the increase in reported violent crime because previously that was going un unreported. Mm -hmm. Now it's being reported. Now, you could say that the fact that it's happening is a terrible thing, which it is. The fact that more of it's being reported... I never want to say that it's a good thing because, you know, it'd be better for it not to be happening in the first place. But the fact that we've created this new offence and now women in particular are saying, actually, I don't have to put up with mm -hmm. this. That's, then, that's then, a step in the right yeah, direction. And then there's more offences and crimes on the books, right? Because it looks like, yeah. yeah. COVID and capital gains. More with the Prime Minister after the break. Well, that was a bit of a bugger getting the uh, COVID, wasn't it? Terrible timing, um, you know, but it, it kind of, it, it's a bit of a metaphor for the last three years, really. I mean, the last three years we've had COVID disrupting everything that's happened and disrupted the campaign too. So research came out recently that said that thanks to the plan that was put into place, around 20,000 lives may have been saved. And we know this is still here, obviously. Um, but, you know, it did feel like that was a time when we were in it together, though there was a sort of rump of people who felt isolated. Do you feel that that kind of bitterness, that residual discontent is spilling into the campaign? Our COVID response worked because people were willing to do the right thing. You know, if, if we'd said to people, stay home, isolate at home, and they hadn't wanted to, it never would have worked. It only worked because actually there was goodwill and people were willing to make that uh, sacrifice in order to support others. Um, I think that goodwill is still there, um, but I think there's a growing segment of the community that by the end of our COVID response weren't there with everybody else. Mm. Um, it's still a min it is a minority, and it's a relatively small minority, but it's a bigger group than it was, you know, when we were at the peak of the COVID response. Mm. I just wonder whether that's something to do with people going, we need change, we need change. I, I think the mood around change is, is different again. I don't think that that necessarily has the, been the catalyst for change. So, yes, there's been a very vocal anti-vax group in this campaign and, you know, people who are sort of just very anti-government, anti-labour, anti-establishment. I still think that they're a relatively small minority, though they make a lot of noise. I think the broader sentiment really is driven um, by cost of living. You know, cost of living has certainly been something that families have felt squeezed by. A lot of families this year have seen their mortgage interest rates, if they've got a mortgage, they've rolled onto a higher interest rate. In some cases, their mortgage repayments will have doubled on a weekly or fortnightly basis. So that's going to create a certain kind of disgruntlement out there amongst the population. But I think increasingly, as the campaign's gone along, people have been starting to think, yeah, maybe we were thinking about change, but change to what? Mm -hmm. You know, what's that change actually going to do for us? So I guess there was a moment in, in your campaign where you announced something and I went, oh, OK. So that's when you made your announcement around not having a wealth or capital gains tax. Mm. And that was despite advice from the tax advisory group, despite the support of your caucus and ministers. Why did you do that? I made the decision on the wealth tax after looking at all of the advice on it. The wealth tax, uh, in my mind, would be quite problematic because you'd be taxing unrealised gains. So if you take a family farm, for example, people might have been farming that for generations, and then you'd be taxing them based on the value of their farm, even though they might not actually be generating the sort of income that might correspond with them being able to pay taxes based on the current value of the farm. Uh, on the other hand, a, wealth, uh, a capital gains tax, 
I've always been open to the fact that you know, I think there's merit in um, a fair tax system um, and the untaxed nature of capital gains sets us apart from the rest of the world. But the reality is a capital gains tax requires a degree of political consensus, otherwise it won't work because capital gains taxes need to be in place for a long period of time before they generate any significant amount of revenue. And as long as you'd have the opposition saying that no, we're just going to get rid of it, um, then actually it, we would never really deliver the sort of benefit that you'd need it to deliver. So um, your rationale for not putting it through or supporting it because National might change it or it's going to take too long, I don't understand that rationale. Capital gains tax, um, in the first five or six years that a CGT is in place, you don't actually generate very much income out of it. So um, it's not like we could say, right, we're going to introduce a capital gains tax and we're going to use that to spend on a whole lot of other things here and now because... It just wouldn't generate that income. Now, now in general, yeah. No, yeah. if you introduced a capital gains tax in 10 years' time, it'd give you more options. If a capital gains tax is your way of dealing with inequality, you have to be in it for at least 10 years. So you didn't um, swap things away on principle? The capital gains tax was a, a relatively pragmatic decision because um, even if we wanted to really tackle inequality by introducing a capital gains tax, we'd have to basically be saying we're confident we're going to be in government for 10 to 15 years. Um, the reality is New Zealand's political electoral cycle with a three-year term um, means that we have to be more realistic than that. The issue around a wealth tax, though, is, is more of a principled one. It is about saying, I, don't, I actually don't think it would work. So that's uh, against expert advice? Well, the expert advice on a wealth tax was very mixed. The, um, the expert advisory group weren't recommending a wealth tax. What about a windfall tax? Is that off the table too? I've never said that that's off the table. I do think that um, if you look at the two areas where at the moment that could be on the cards around banks and around supermarkets, I think in the case of supermarkets, I'd prefer that they weren't in a position where they're making the windfall profits in the first place. I mean, the lack of competition in our supermarket grocery mm -hmm. sector is, is a real problem. In terms of banks, um, I think that's something we've got to monitor very, very closely because... Uh, I do want to make sure that banks aren't gouging people um, at a time when, really, you know, households are feeling the squeak. Labor won on a ticket of transformation and the critics have said that they're still looking for it. I think if you look at the transformation that we have actually been doing, I believe we have been a transformational government. For the, the 77,000 kids who aren't living in poverty anymore, I think that's a pretty transformational thing for um, our schools, our hospitals, where we've got huge rebuilding work underway. And we really are, I think after years of neglecting our public services, reinvesting in them, I think we've been transformational. If you're a nurse and you've seen your pay go up by over $40,000 a year, I think that's pretty transformational for you. So I think, uh, you know, transformation doesn't happen overnight. Uh, but I think if you look at the progress that we've made across a whole range of areas, um, there's no doubt we're making a huge difference. So is the messaging not getting out there? Oh, look, I, I think people tend to think about their here and now rather than what's happened and what's going to happen in the future. That's kind of the, the thing when you were the incumbent, isn't it? People are, I mean, it's a little bit challenging, sort of defending, I guess, the status quo? Uh, always. I mean, look, I, I, I'm not here campaigning to be, you know, for a full term as Prime Minister because I think everything's perfect. I'm here um, campaigning to get another three years because there's a lot more that still needs to be done. Now, when I've interviewed um, Mr Peters and Mr Luxon and Mr Seymour, their, their um, co-governance is something that they're quite... Um, what's the word? Divisive? Divisive about. Look, yeah, uh, they have... They have ash um, issues around it. What's your understanding of the relationship between Tino Ranga Tiritanga and Kawanatanga? Well, the two, they, the two go hand in hand. They're the two, the two first articles of the treaty. And I think that we have to recognise that actually we need both of them to work together. So um, Kawanatanga means that we, we, that we do have one system of governorship for the country. That's what the treaty put in place. But within that, Tino Ranga Tiritanga is also still really important. So, uh, you know, the ability um, for Māori to have self-determination is still a very important part of living within a framework of kawanatanga. And I don't think we, it's one that we should be afraid of. So why is it that um, that people are still afraid? We started talking about this last time, and there have been moves in co-governance. Uh, the, ch the charge has been that you haven't explained it well enough. Well, in the time, short time that I've been doing this job, I've you know tried to uh, be very open about what we're doing and why we're doing it. Uh, I think that that is something that I think governments 
plural, not just our government, haven't done well in the past. If you look at co-governance, it's nothing new. It's been introduced in a multitude of different ways over the decades. Um, treaty settlements under successive governments, Labour and National, have contained co-governance arrangements mm. within them. Um, and they work incredibly successfully. So there's nothing to be afraid of. But your question really is, why are people afraid? I think it's the uncertainty of the unknown. There is a perception out there that if Māori are getting something, that that means that someone else is missing out. Mm. And I don't believe that to be true, but that is what a, a reasonable proportion of the um, population are, I guess, scared about. Mm. And so how do you combat that? I think by being open and having the conversation with people and explaining, actually, no, you're not losing out. By establishing a Māori health authority so that we get better health outcomes for Māori, that doesn't suddenly mean that um, non-Māori are going to have worse health care or worse access yeah. to health outcomes. The, the criticism around that is somehow that um, people are getting confused about um, or conflating co-governance with sovereignty. Yeah, and I think... But even within... A conversation around the treaty, you know, kāwanatanga and tiruranga, tiratanga. I think when we use a word like sovereignty, they sort of think, does that mean we're going to have two completely separate governments and one group of people are going to live under one set of laws and another group of people are going to live under another mm. set of laws? I don't view it that way. I don't actually think that that's what the treaty was designed to set up. I think it was designed to have one system of governorship, but within that for Māori to still have tēnā ranga tēnā tanga, and I don't see the two things as being incompatible. The opposition are committed to getting rid of the Māori Health Authority. What would be the economic and health costs involved in that? Well, I mean, ultimately, I think if you flip it the other way around and say, what have we got to gain from better health outcomes for Māori? If we have higher life expectancy for Māori, um, if we have uh, uh, better health outcomes for Māori, then actually the entire New Zealand population is going to benefit from that. The health system is going to benefit from that. Um, employers are going to benefit from that. Everybody will benefit from that. So I think we have everything to gain by getting better health and more equitable health outcomes for Māori. It's been framed as a separate system, but it's still within, well, I guess, the Ministry of Health. So how, how do you allay the fears? or Well, how do you deal with that kind of criticism? It's not a separate system any more than um, Kura Kaupapa or Kohanga Reo are separate systems for education. They're not. I mean, they're still within the, the overall umbrella of our public education system, but mm. they have a different flavour, mm. a different way of operating, different strengths. And those strengths, actually, when you look at the data show that it works. Mm. So I can tell you, if you look at NCEA data, for example, Māori kids doing NCEA in um, a Māori immersion environment actually do better than Māori kids doing NCEA in an English mm. immersion environment. And uh, there's a lesson in that, surely. Three waters. Um, that was a bit of a lightning rod. And I guess Nanaya Mahuta copped most of that flak. Um, and uh, Willie Jackson tried hard to defend it. What did you learn from that whole exercise? I think there are some lessons that we need to reflect on as a team. I think one is we left Nanaya out there fronting that for too long without sufficient support from, from the rest of her team. And uh, I think that was really unjust because I think a lot of the criticism of Nanaya, a lot of the abuse that she dealt with was just disgusting and wrong. And we should have been faster to step in behind her and say, actually, we're not going to put up with this. This isn't right. Um, I think there was... We should have explained a bit more at the beginning about why were we even having this conversation around co-governance and water entities? You know, I think people have missed the fact that actually Māori have an established legal interest in water. It's been through the courts. It's already there. So if we're not talking about having um, an active role in the way water, to, water entities are established, what's the alternative? Mm. And I think that's the key question. Is the alternative to extinguish the rights that have already been legally established? Because if it's not, then actually what is the alternative? Mm. Climate and the countdown. We're back with Labour leader Chris Hipkins after the break. Will Labor, if you get back in, support mana whenua to um, have a ban on onshore oil, gas and coal exploration and stop new permits for seabed mining to build on what you've done previously? So certainly the, the ban on offshore oil and gas exploration, which we've put in place, we're keeping yes. that, no question. 
onshore. That's um, we haven't we, we're not proposing further change in that area at this at this coming election. We still have a demand for oil and gas at the moment. I think the key thing we've got to do though is decrease that demand. If we really want to get serious about climate change, it means turning down our emissions. Now that does mean less oil and less use of oil and gas. Are you able to confidently look at your children and say you're doing all you can to fight the climate crisis? Yes, but there is a lot more to do and it is urgent and we cannot afford to turn back now. I think we're right at a tipping point. I think we're at a critical moment where we can either drive forward and dramatically reduce our emissions, which we've got a plan to do, or we can step back, which is what the National Act, New Zealand First Coalition seem to be suggesting. We must continue to drive forward. Mm. Now, what's been the hardest call as, um, as a Prime Minister under your watch? What's been your hardest call? I think every single one of them. I mean, um, every day you're faced with huge dilemmas and huge challenges. I think about um, petrol prices. We had to make the decision not to extend the fuel subsidies that were keeping petrol prices lower than they had previously been. A, we couldn't afford to continue with those subsidies. But B, it wasn't actually necessarily the best way to help people through the cost of living crisis, but it was still a tough decision. Decisions around um, the flood affected and cyclone affected areas in terms of the residential buyouts, those were big decisions. That was big challenging stuff and we had to be fair, you know, we had to treat people fairly, but none of it was easy. National has rolled out John Key to promote two ticks. Um, might you roll out someone or are you feeling pretty confident? Oh, look, Helen Clark spoke at our campaign launch. Um, that was a bit overshadowed by the fact that we had some other people causing a disturbance in the audience. Mm. Um, Jacinda Ardern has been doing her a little bit from overseas. She's out of the country at the moment. Um, so you might see a little bit more of both of them in the, in the final week of the campaign. Mr Luxon, uh, early on in that campaign, described a Labour-led coalition as a coalition of chaos. What are your thoughts now in response to that? I think anyone watching the minor leaders' debates will clearly see where the chaos will potentially exist. It would be a National Act, New Zealand First Government. Actually, Labour, the Greens and Te Pāti Māori have a history of working reasonably constructively together. I'm absolutely confident that if that's what the electorate determined they wanted us to do in the next parliament, that's exactly what we could do. So you've got a reputation as a fixer. Are you going to do it? Absolutely. You ready? Yep. Got enough mongrel in you, got enough fight? Absolutely. Look, the last seven days of the campaign is going to make a big difference. Um, before the last election, the polls weren't showing that we were going to win a majority. There's a 10-point difference between the polls that came out three days before an election and what actually happened on election day. Anything could happen in the next seven days. I think a lot of Kiwis are standing back and they haven't made up their minds yet. We're going to help them make up their minds in the next week. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you. Yeah, all the best. Cheers.